Welcome to Radicon presentation for COVID-19, our radiology pathology review. You are welcome to listen to this lecture on our YouTube channel. You can also listen to this lecture on our website www.radicon.org where you can join in for video presentation, answer a quiz and get your COVID-19 radiology CME certificate. This presentation is divided into five parts we will discuss basic microorganism and viral facts. Is virus a living thing or something else? How and where does it affect human body? What are the imaging findings and literature review? What is an effective use of radiology department and what are the required precautions? This is Dr. B and I will be with you in this journey. Scientific knowledge of microbial infections began in year 1020 when Avicenna, shown in the top image, suggested that TB and some other diseases might be contagious and a 40-day period of quarantine was essential to weaken the spread of contagious infections. That was very basic understanding. The real breakthrough came in 1673 when Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, shown in the middle image, designed his own lenses and saw the microorganisms. Leonhawk's most remarkable microscopic discovery was bacteria. They were just at the limit of what his simple lenses could make out. It was one of the most striking hiatuses in the history of science, and no one else would see bacteria again for over a century. His observations had also included protozoans, which he called animalcules. It is no wonder that he is considered the father of microbiology. Lastly, you can see two tobacco leaves, one normal while other is abnormal with mosaic pattern of a disease. It was called tobacco mosaic disease attributed to a non-bacterial pathogen as suggested by Dmitry Ivanovsky in 1892 and Martinez Vigernik in 1898 who are credited for discovery of viruses leading to a new discipline of virology. A virus is a sub-microscopic infectious non-living agent that replicates only inside a cell of another living organism. More than 5,000 viral species have been described in detail while there are really millions of types of viruses in the environment. Viruses are found in almost every ecosystem on the earth and are most numerous type of biological entity. The study of viruses is known as virology which is subspeciality of microbiology. Although viruses are considered non-living, they seem to have genetic material and become biologically active in a host. A broad classification of viruses divides them on basis of genetic material. RNA viruses, which have RNA as their genetic material, and DNA viruses, which have DNA as genetic material and replicate using a DNA-dependent polymerase. Examples of RNA viruses are common cold, influenza, SARS, COVID-19, hepatitis C and E, West Nile fever, Ebola virus disease, rabies, polio and measles. Examples of DNA viruses are adenoviruses, herpes viruses, bacteriophages. Some of the illnesses caused by DNA viruses are hepatitis B, smallpox, herpes, chickenpox, etc. There is another type of viruses called retroviruses, which are RNA viruses which use reverse transcriptase to make DNA indeterminates in their replication cycle. We are aware that DNA is our genetic material and it communicates with body by making its small copies called messenger RNA. The messenger RNA enables a cell for protein synthesis. Inside a host cell, viruses also generate messenger RNA from their genome to produce proteins and replicate themselves, but different mechanisms are used to achieve this in each virus family used for their classification. Riboviruses are a group of RNA viruses. They are extremely diverse genetically and infect almost all living organisms including unicellulars. These have very high rates of mutation as they lack DNA proof readability. High rates of mutation in riboviruses result in new viral strains and makes it extremely difficult to make an effective vaccine. 
Riboviruses have led to multiple outbreaks of respiratory illnesses such as SARS, MERS-CoV, bird flu, and swine flu. Coronaviruses The name was first used in 1968 by an informal group of virologists in general nature to designate a new family of viruses. The name coronavirus is derived from Latin word corona meaning crown which itself is a borrowing from a Greek word which means garland. Coronaviruses are divided into four types, alpha coronaviruses and beta coronaviruses which infect mammals and gamma coronaviruses, delta coronaviruses which primarily infect birds. Viruses are known for respiratory tract infections. These can be upper respiratory tract infections such as common cold, pharyngitis, apiglottitis, laryngotracheitis, and the associated changes such as sinusitis or otitis. Or the viral illnesses can be lower respiratory tract illnesses such as bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and pneumonias. Common cold. Normally caused by rhinoviruses, which are also ribovirus or RNA virus family. These have more than 100 serotypes and are most common pathogens. At least 25% of colds in adults are caused by rhinoviruses. Coronaviruses may be responsible for more than 10% of cases. Other pathogens include parainfluenza viruses, RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, adenoviruses, and influenza. Pharyngitis or sore throat is mainly viral and accompanies common cold or influenza. However, type A Coxsackie virus, adenovirus, herpes simplex, and sometimes Epstein-Barr virus and cytomegalovirus can also cause the same. Upper respiratory tract infections are usually benign, transitory, and self-limited. Although epiglottitis and laryngotracheitis or croup can be serious disease in children and young infants. Epiglottitis is mainly viral in origin and mostly caused by H. influenza type B. This is photo of an adult 48 years old man presented in an urgent care clinic with a dinophagia and fever. A radiograph of neck showed thumb sign and a diagnosis of epiglottitis was made as highlighted with an arrow on the lateral neck radiograph. A direct visualization showed marked inflammation of the epiglottis and in the surrounding a repeat laryngoscopy two weeks after the initial presentation showed complete resolution of the infection as seen on the left side of the screen. Interestingly, however, the culture results in this one showed it to be a bacterial infection. Parent influenza viruses are the most common pathogen in laryngotracheitis or croup. Steeple sign is a radiological sign found on an acridiograph where infection and mucosal edema in subglottic trachea results in luminal narrowing and it appears like a church steeple. The above radiograph shows a steeple sign of croup or laryngotracheitis and is a clinical emergency. Bronchitis is a lower respiratory tract infection and is usually preceded by an upper respiratory tract infection or forms part of a clinical syndrome in diseases such as influenza, rubella, rubella, pertussis, scarlet fever, and typhoid. Bronchiolitis is a viral respiratory disease of infants and it primarily affects smaller airways, common viruses being parainfluenza, influenza, adenoviruses, and RSV or respiratory syncytial virus. In lower respiratory tract illnesses, in addition to bronchitis and bronchiolitis, viral pneumonias can happen. These are rare in healthy civilian individuals. However, influenza viruses can be an exception with high mortality in elderly with comorbidities. Secondary bacterial pneumonia, particularly staphylococcal pneumonias, can happen. RSV or respiratory syncytial virus can cause severe pneumonia among infants and institutionalized adults. Adenoviruses may also cause pneumonias, where serotype A adenoviruses have been associated with severe fatal pneumonia in infants. Varicella zoster virus pneumonitis is rare in children, but it is not uncommon in individuals over 19 years old, and mortality can be as high as 10% to 30%. And measles pneumonias can occur in adults. 
that concludes our discussion on viruses, their origin, their types, and various pathologies caused by these. The next, we will look at the coronavirus and its imaging findings. In the third section of this presentation, the imaging findings, we will discuss primary pulmonary findings on chest x-rays and CT with some secondary pulmonary findings as well as structured reporting for COVID-19 cases. A number of factors affect the use of chest x-rays in COVID imaging. The first factor would be findings. Chest x-rays can show subtle findings in mild or early COVID infections. Naturally, the moderate and severe infections will have more findings. However, despite this simple fact, radiology departments across the world have a very varied experience on use of chest x-ray in COVID imaging. Imagine a strict public health model which requires isolation of all infected patients. However, the problem is reliability of COVID testing is limited and turnaround times are long. In this case, the role of chest x-ray is limited and CT is preferred for early mnemonic changes. When patients are encouraged to present early in the course of disease, as was the case in Wuhan, China, chest x-ray had little value. Alternatively, in New York City, where patients were instructed to stay at home until they experienced advanced symptoms, chest x-rays were often abnormal at the time of presentation. Availability of CT is another important factor. Its availability or lack of a CT scanner will naturally affect the use of chest x-rays as imaging modality. Equipment and resources, chest x-ray portability and imaging within an infected patient's isolation room is an important factor which may favor chest x-rays in selected population, effectively eliminating the risk of COVID transmission along the transport route to a CT scanner, particularly in the environments lacking PPE. Inpatient monitoring. In hospitalized patients, chest x-rays can be useful for assessing the disease progression and alternative diagnosis such as low bar pneumonia, bacterial superinfection, pneumothorax, and pleural effusion. This is a chest x-ray in a 55 years old male patient which shows typical findings of a mild viral illness. There are early perihilar infiltrates with peribronchial cuffing and mildly hyperinflated lungs. It is a mild case of viral illness which turned out to be COVID-19 positive. Chest X-ray in a 47 years old male patient shows typical findings of mild to moderate viral illness. There are early hyalur infiltrates with peribronchial cuffing. However, now we can see airspace shadowing in the left upper and middle zones and further changes in the lung bases as well. It is a mild to moderate case of viral illness which turned out to be COVID positive as well. This is a case of moderate viral illness in a 60 years old patient with positive COVID results. Now we can see perihilar shadowing as well as bilateral more confluent and larger ground glass changes progressing to consolidation. A special note for radiology residents, airspace opacification can be mild when we can see pulmonary vasculature and septa through it. It is called ground glass opacity. However, when it becomes more confluent and vessels are not seen through it, the opacity is called consolidation. Consolidation literally means filling up of air space. Normally it happens in one of four cases. One, pus in the cases of pneumonia. Two, water as in pulmonary edema. Three, blood in cases of pulmonary hemorrhage. And finally, fourth, cells or soft tissues in cases of tumor. In COVID or corona imaging, it is most likely primary or secondary infective consolidation where there are some suggestion of lack of inflammatory markers maybe hinting at an alternative explanation of consolidation such as pulmonary hemorrhage. This is another case of moderate to severe illness with bilateral patchy consolidations. An 81 years old patient with severe case of COVID-19, film taken in recess with widespread consolidation in both lungs, in keeping with clinical impression of respiratory distress. Another severe case with extensive bilateral consolidation, however, care must be taken to exclude pulmonary edema. 
This one, however, was a 39 years old known case of COVID-19 in ICU. These chest x-rays are courtesy of Dr. Mary Roddy, consultant chest radiologist from Charing Cross Hospital, London. These were graded by consensus opinion of three thoracic radiologists. In first image on the right, a chest radiograph in a patient with COVID-19 infection demonstrates right infrahyalur airspace opacities. A subsequent CT as seen on the left side shows same patient demonstrating peripheral right lower lobe ground glass opacities. A follow-up chest CT axial images performed two days later show improvement in the extent of ground glass opacity with more subpleural calvilinear lines or atelectasis. Next case, axial chest CT image at presentation shows a small solitary nodular ground glass opacity in the left upper lobe. In the same patient, there is progression of airspace disease three days later with new foci of ground glass opacities as well as developing consolidation. There is high peripheral attenuation with ground glass opacities more centrally representing a reverse halo sign. Imaging findings of CT and X-ray can be summarized as follows. On X-ray, perihyalur infiltrates, peribronchial cuffing, ground glass opacity, most likely peripheral and patchy, bronchopneumonias and lobar pneumonias. On CT, ground glass opacity is almost always seen, involvement of multiple lobes with subpleural and peripheral distribution of the ground glass, consolidations, septal thickening, bronchial dilatation and wall thickening. There are certain important considerations duration of the complaints is important as it determines the age and extent of disease. The radiology report should discuss findings with chances of COVID-19 and possible differential diagnosis as the appearances will overlap with certain other diseases such as H1N1, viral pneumonias, organizing pneumonias and acute interstitial pneumonitis. In addition to airway and pulmonary parenchymal changes, there are secondary findings worth noting. In this case of a 57 years old man with COVID-19 pneumonia, coronal MIP slab of CT pulmonary angiogram shows multiple bilateral filling defects involving lobar, segmental and subsegmental branches of pulmonary artery in keeping with pulmonary embolism. Let's have a brief literature review about role of CT, spectrum of findings, limitation of CT findings, a summary, and finally extra pulmonary spectrum. Radiological findings from 81 patients with COVID-19 pneumonia in Wuhan City, China was a landmark study published in Lancet. The study discussed 81 patients confirmed to have COVID-19 infections with abnormal findings on CT chest in all 100% cases. 15 cases of asymptomatic infections were discovered on the basis of abnormal lung findings on CT scans, suggesting that chest CT scans or serum antibody tests should be done in asymptomatic high-risk individuals with history of exposure to patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. It will facilitate early identification of the disease. In the early days of COVID infection, little was known in literature and Chinese data suggested very promising and hopeful diagnostic tool in form of CT chest, in addition to gold standard PCR testing. Naturally, the benefit of CT chest was quick availability and faster results compared to slow and time-taking PCR. Clinical Characteristics of Coronavirus Disease 2019 in China was published in New England Journal of Medicine. It had 1,099 patients with COVID-19 infection. 86% revealed abnormal results on CT scans at the time of admission. It showed false negative CT cases where no radiographic or CT abnormality was seen in 157 patients, approximately 18% people with non-severe disease in five 
of 173 patients with severe disease, approximating 3% cases did not show a CT abnormality. The most common patterns on chest CT were ground glass opacity and bilateral patchy shadowing. This was one of the very early systematic reviews of imaging findings in COVID-19 infections comprising 30 studies, 19 case series and 11 case reports. After combining of the available data, the characteristic pattern and distribution of CT manifestations were ground glass opacity in approximately 88% cases, bilateral involvement in 87% cases, peripheral distribution in 76% cases, and multi-lobe involvement in 79% of cases. Pulmonary findings in infections have a varied spectrum. Some of these are more often seen in COVID, while others were not seen in COVID cases and suggested alternate diagnosis. CT features inconsistent with COVID-19 have been found to be tree in butt appearances, centri lobular distribution, bronchovascular distribution, predominantly nodular opacities, cavitation, lymphadenopathy, and pleural effusion. If these features are present, an alternate diagnosis or superinfection should be considered. CT suggestive of COVID-19 infection have been ground glass opacity or consolidations, bilateral and multifocal involvement, peripheral distribution, rounded opacities, while late features have been linear opacities, crazy paving pattern, and reverse halo. Evidence is emerging that COVID patients can have respiratory distress and acute lung injury triggered by cytokine storm. Unfortunately, these changes are not limited to lungs and multi-organ failure can develop. There have been several cases of viral encephalitis in patients infected with coronaviruses. Three of such cases are shown in this picture from 2015 where corona MERS-CoV broke out in Saudi Arabia and a range of intracranial findings were seen in these patients, including diffusion restriction of the multiple white matter lesions with no post-contrast enhancement. Multiple flare hyperintense lesions were seen in subcortical areas and deep white matter of frontal, temporal, parietal lobes bilaterally as well as in corpus callosum. Other abnormalities were diffusion restriction of bilateral frontal lobes and corpus callosum lesions and diffuse white matter ch signal changes in the insular cortex bilaterally. Also, in the last row, the coronal T2 weighted images and the bottom shows abnormality involving corticospinal tract bilaterally extending to the brainstem. In section 5 of this presentation, we will discuss use of radiology department in COVID pandemic. What are the factors affecting the radiology departments? How to manage departmental workflows? Do we need protocols and why? What are the current radiology challenges and recommendations? We will discuss certain imaging guidelines and where do we stand and how is radiology affected by limitations and future scope or speed of PCR. How to plan patient and staff protection, staff PPE, and departmental cleaning or disinfection. Finally, the need for education and training will be discussed in this section. The role of imaging and extent of that role is influenced by a range of factors. Most prominent of that is RT-PCR, real-time PCR or reverse transcriptase PCR. It has been showing 42% to 71% of sensitivity with false negative testing of up to 29%. It has shown time constraints and was taking initially up to a week. However, testing is now much quicker and various types of tests require careful interpretation in terms of antigen or antibody testing. Availability or limitation of PCR defines the role of imaging as a support mechanism, especially in those areas which are influenced by availability or shortage of the test kits. And if a quick turnaround time is required, 
And finally, radiology can be very useful in prognostic value in terms of disease progression or recovery monitoring. It will be of value to see the pulmonary parenchyma after first infection with in COVID patients. All imaging departments need to be proactive to ensure prompt response to COVID patients. There should be an understanding and a triage pathway specifically for suspected COVID patients. Once the triage pathway is activated, an agreed fast-track diagnostic algorithm should be in place, which will require clinical lab and imaging collaboration. The teams should be familiar with the fast-track pathway to handle possible screening patients or known cases of COVID-19 for diagnostic or prognostic assessment. Such measures will avoid congestion in the radiology department and will reduce unnecessary staff and patient exposure. It is not easy to agree upon such diagnostic algorithms, varying sizes and specialities of hospital, varying population demographics, weather, proportion of elderly in a community, strength of public health systems, blend of governmental, private and insurance-based model of clinical and health care. These are important factors to be considered. Hence, there have been a constant evolution of advice based on current evidence and resources. Central academic bodies such as British Society of Thoracic Imaging, Royal College of Radiology, American College of Radiology and European Society of Radiology have been main source to advise to departments of health in several countries. Evolving statement by these institutions, however, have been conflicting. On 6th of March 2020, the British Society of Thoracic Imaging noted that CT was not felt to have a role in COVID-19 diagnosis. This statement was revised on 11th of March. It was still not recommended but may be used for risk stratification. Royal College of Radiologists on 12th of March 2020, Royal College statement did not see a role for CT in diagnostic assessment. However, it was revised on 27th of March 2020 and said CT may have a role in stratifying risk in acute patients, especially those requiring CT abdomen and needing surgery. American College of Radiologists on 23rd, 22nd of March 2020 said CT not recommended for screening but only for symptomatic patients. European Society of Radiology noted on 2nd of February that CT is not for screening but helpful for patients with mild symptoms who have other risk factors. Please note that most of this advice was at time when there were long waiting times for RT-PCR testing due to limited testing facilities. It had multifold reasoning. On one hand, it limited the use of CT scan in Western countries as opposed to Chinese literature. On the other hand, it limited spread of infection to radiology health staff, with radiology being high risk for transmission due to enclosed spaces, lack of protective kits, and almost no negative pressure chilled air-conditioned rooms. It had positive effect to avoid choking of the diagnostic pathways which proved a big hurdle in most of European and American hospitals. After a fair confusion and evolving guidelines by multiple institutions, finally a more robust guideline came from Fleischer Society on 7th of April 2020. The Fleischer statement was uniquely comprised of a multidisciplinary panel comprising principally of radiologists and pulmonologists from 10 countries with experience managing COVID-19 patients across a spectrum of healthcare environments. It initiated, imaging is not indicated with patients with suspected COVID-19 and mild clinical features unless there are risks of disease progression. Number two, imaging is indicated in patients with COVID-19 and worsening respiratory status. Three, in a resource-constrained environment, imaging is indicated for medical triage of patients with suspected COVID-19 
who present with moderate to severe clinical features and a high pretrest probability of disease. We will look into those in detail now. The Fleischer statement or guidance describes three different scenarios based on clinical features, pretest probability, and resource constraints. The table describes the definition and criteria for key components of these clinical scenarios. The severity of respiratory disease can be mild or can be moderate to severe. In mild, no evidence of significant pulmonary dysfunction or damage, such as absence of hypoxemia or no or mild dyspnea. In moderate to severe cases, evidence of significant pulmonary dysfunction or damage may be present, such as hypoxemia or moderate to severe dyspnea. The other factor is pretest probability. Based on the background prevalence of disease as estimated by observed transmission patterns may be further modified by individual's exposure risk and can be subcategorized as low pretest probability like sporadic transmission, medium pretest probability like clustered transmission, or high pretest probability at the time of community transmission. The resource constraint is the third factor which corresponds to availability of personal, personal protective equipment, COVID-19 testing, hospital beds, or ventilators with the need to rapidly triage patients. The first clinical scenario has mild features referring to absence of significant or pulmonary dysfunction or damage with any pretest probability based on the background prevalence of the disease which could be further modified by a patient's individual exposure risk. In such scenario, a negative COVID-19 test and low pretest probability does not warrant any further imaging. Only if there are high risk factors for the disease progression, imaging may be indicated in selective cases. So summing it up, in scenario one with mild features, with negative COVID testing and low pretest probability, there is no much scope of imaging. However, if the test comes positive or there are high pretest probability with high risk factors, then imaging may be indicated. In the second scenario, with moderate to severe symptoms, any pretest probability and no resource constraints, imaging would be required irrespective of the results of COVID 19 test results. In cases with negative testing, as seen on the right side, repeat testing or imaging may be required and an alternate diagnosis should be considered. Third scenario is more relevant to most places. It assumes moderate to severe symptoms, high pretest probability, and that resources are now limited or constrained. Moderate to severe features refer to evidence of significant pulmonary dysfunction or damage. High pretest probability is based upon high background prevalence of disease associated with community transmission. And rapid COVID-19 test is point of care test with less than one hour turnaround time. If the test kit is not available and result is negative in moderate or severe clinical features, Imaging is required and consultation suggested for investigating alternate diagnosis. If patient has strong features of COVID, then imaging may help in medical triage and further management. Left side of the picture shows cases where COVID test is available and positive. Then imaging may be indicated initially as a baseline and later for monitoring the respiratory status. Summary of Fleischner recommendations. The main recommendations are, number one, imaging is not routinely indicated as screening test for COVID-19 in asymptomatic individuals. Number two, imaging is not indicated for patients with mild features of COVID-19 unless they are at risk for disease progression as seen on scenario one. Number three, Imaging is indicated for patients with moderate to severe features of COVID-19 
regardless of COVID-19 test results as seen in scenario 2 and 3. Imaging is indicated for patients with COVID-19 and evidence of worsening respiratory status seen in all scenarios. Point 5. In a resource-constrained environment where access to CT is limited, chest x-ray may be preferred for patients with COVID-19 unless features of respiratory worsening warrant the use of CT as seen in scenario 2 and 3. There are certain additional recommendations. Daily chest radiographs are not indicated in stable intubated patients with COVID-19. CT is indicated in patients with functional impairment with hypoxemia after recovery from COVID-19. And finally, COVID-19 testing is indicated in patients incidentally found to have findings suggestive of COVID-19 on a CT scan. Okay, we are in section 5 of this presentation, which is use of radiology department. We discussed factors affecting imaging services. Then we discussed departmental workflow. And the third point was imaging guidelines by various academic organizations. And now we are in patient and staff protection area. The main challenges are contamination of passages with patient movement, transmission of COVID to other patient, increased radiation risk for population, risk of cross-infection, if disinfection is not done properly, infection transmission risk to staff due to increased exposure, and finally, consumption of personal protective equipments or PPEs. These challenges or risks can be minimized by certain risk management solutions or principles. For example, contamination of passages and transmission risk to other patients can be minimized by intense cleaning drive special zoning of dirty and clean scanners and special timing such as scanning the positive or suspected patients towards the end of the day. Number three, increased radiation risk can be reduced by special low-dose CT modules. Number four, risk of cross-infection if disinfection is not adequate would mandate a robust cleaning protocol and special resources. A risk of transmission to staff can be reduced by availability of adequate staff PPE. However, this will result in consumption of PPE at massive scale and would require a robust procurement for availability and an effective workflow and strategy to minimize an effective use of PPE. Some of these risk management principles or solutions will result in increased hospital cost and may not be most popular methods employed in various organizations. Certain other risk management principles are workforce preservation by reducing working hours for the staff, alternate duty shifts, emergency imaging only, and restricting visitor entry to the department and tele-reporting wherever possible. Also, ensuring availability of PPE to general staff, especially high-risk staff at the reception, radiographers, sonologists or sonographers, the cleaning staff, and radiologists, in particular international radiologists. One of the most debated and sensitive topic among health professionals during corona epidemic has been PPE. Availability of PPE and staff protection to preserve healthcare services is absolute essential. However, worldwide shortage of these has resulted in suboptimal working environment following other recommendations used at our center. Surgical masks, shield and gloves in general areas and routine radiography. Use N95 mask, gown and glove only when you are doing aerosol generating procedure or you are handling direct contact with sick COVID patients. Gloves is not a replacement for hand hygiene. We should frequently sanitize or wash hands. Do not use sanitizer on gloves. Do not use overall in outpatient settings for contamination risk. If you are not handling suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases, 
you do not need N95 mask. Following is the CDC advice on PPE while caring for COVID patients. It stresses on need for identifying correct PPE and training to use with awareness of its limitation and how to maintain or dispose of PPE. PPE must be donned correctly before entering patient areas. PPE must remain in place and must be worn correctly for duration of work in contaminated areas. It should not be adjusted such as retying the gown or adjusting mask. PPE must be removed slowly in sequence to prevent self-contamination. A step-by-step -step approach should be developed and used during training and real patient care. A preferred PPE for use is N95 respirator with face shield or goggles, one pair of clean and non-sterile gloves, and an isolation gown. However, if an N95 or a better mask is not available, a face mask with face shield and goggles can be acceptable alternative. CDC stresses on the need of donning or putting on the protective gear. It begins with identifying the correct PPE, performing hand hygiene, putting on the isolation gown, then face mask or N95 mask, then putting on face shield or goggles, after which you should perform hand hygiene before putting on gloves. And then healthcare staff can enter the patient room. After the exposure to a COVID patient in patient's room or in a CT scanner, you will be required to take off the protective gear it will begin with removing the gloves and gown before exiting the scanner room or patient room, disposing these off in the appropriate trash box. Then perform hand hygiene, remove face shield or goggles, remove and discard the masks, perform hand hygiene again after removing the masks. Another set of recommendations suggest a 95 mask gloves, face shield, and protective gowns while dealing with COVID patients. For staff dealing with non-COVID patients, gown, glove, and face mask, mask are likely adequate. Although, understandably, many facilities will not have this level of PPE for staff dealing with non-COVID patients. Face masks, gloves, and sanitizers are considered adequate for general staff. And disinfection and cleaning are very important principles of current COVID pandemic. There has to be a massive cleaning campaign every day with regular checks. It is important for staff to wash hands and face regularly. The staff must wash hands on arrival and at the end of the hospital shift. All staff are encouraged to have cleaning at workspaces before and during the work. Staff must clean their hands, mobiles, bags, personal equipment such as glasses and wallet on regular interval so these do not act as vectors for viral transmission. There are general measures advised for cleaning in the departments in which corridor fumigation, scanner cleaning with the alcohol-based wipes, and floor with bleach-based cleaners is suggested. Although most hospitals and radiology departments are likely to have independent cleaning services which have expertise in disinfection of various surfaces and floors, following are some of the chemicals and substances which can be used for a disinfection. Some more precautions for staff at the end of the shift, including home and personal care. General precautions should be adopted, such as removing shoes outside the main door, clinic clothing in a separate container for washing. Do not carry unnecessary hospital equipment and personal items to home, including used PPE, washing hands and shower before mixing with the family members, 
may be a good solution. There is no indication for mask use inside the home. Education, training and awareness are few of the strongest tools in fight against corona. It can be done via educational videos on TV screens, in, at homes or hospitals, or by use of educational posters to disseminate guidelines and educational material. Remember, corona is evolving, and so is our response. Guidelines are likely to change and update. A robust education and training plan is essential in these circumstances for safety of patients and staff. And that is end of this presentation. Thanks to all of these wonderful publications and study material used for building this talk. These links offer great material for further study on this topic. This is Dr. B signing off. We wish you the very best in your fight against Corona. Should you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us.